Here at Redburn Village, we work hard to ensure all residents enjoy their retirement in a relaxed, peaceful environment. Our assisted living facilities enable you to enjoy maximum independence, but with a safety net of highly skilled nurses available 24 hours a day, offering you and your loved ones complete peace of mind. It's a glorious place to wake up each morning, cozy, friendly, warm. So why not come see what we have to offer? At Redburn, you won't just live, you'll live to the fullest. The one-eyed cat skulked around my new garden, no doubt gearing up to fertilize the rose bushes, or so it seemed. In retrospect, I may have rushed to judgment, but to be fair, the big move had me all stressed out, and cleaning up some strays of water crap every morning wasn't quite how I had pictured my retirement. By my feet, there were two cardboard boxes. I grabbed a fuzzy slipper from the closest one and shouted, Go on, get out of here. The slipper flew in a smooth arc but missed by a solid three meters. My wife Mary would have hit the roof if she had caught me using animals for target practice, even ugly ones. The little vagrant glanced at the slipper, yawned, and then strode along the side of the house and disappeared. A flea bag, I grumbled. Honestly, Dad, Angela said, as she carried another box out of the van. We've been here for five minutes and you're already all worked up. Remember what the doctors told you? Yeah, yeah, nice and easy. But you've got to show these vermin who's boss. Otherwise, they'll walk all over you. Angela's nose wrinkled. She had a medium build, a short auburn hair, and like her dear mother, a soft spot for animals. Especially the useless ones. That's probably why she had fallen for Patrick who I had clocked for an oxygen thief ever since he asked for help changing a tire on a Ford Escort. We took a moment to survey the peaceful street. The Redburn Village consisted of a huge Georgian mansion surrounded by a semicircle of identical red brick houses. I still don't get why you insisted on being so far out the way, Angela said. I had rented a place at the outermost point, a real sore spot for my daughter. She wanted me in the main facility so the staff could spoon feed me mushy carrots and wipe my butt twice a day, but I quickly poured cold water on that idea. Moya quit worrying. Didn't you see the brochure? If I so much as stub my toe, they'll airdrop in a troop of nurses. After a patented Donnelly eye roll, Angela carried a footstool off into the house. Sometimes I couldn't help but see the funny side of our predicament. It still feels like only yesterday she needed me to shine a flashlight in her closet to chase away the monsters. In the front lounge, she said, I just don't want you to feel like you had to come here. You could always live with me and the kids. Like me, Angela acted a tad hard-headed at times. Sweetie, this was my idea, remember? This place will do grand. Actually, retirement homes sickened me. They're the last stop before checkout, everybody knows that. But Angela had two moody teenagers and an overactive nine-year-old to raise. By herself. Already that house was a circus and I refused to be a burden. After dropping off those first boxes, I went outside to fetch more, only to discover a gray-haired man with narrow cheeks, trimming the hedges along the edge of my garden. Behind him stood a gangly orderly, cursed by the worst case of neck acne you had ever seen. What do you think you're doing? I shouted, rushing over to snatch his shears away. Stringy drool leaked from the corner of the man's mouth, as he mimed clipping the air several times. Well? I asked impatiently. I'm Noel. I'm the gardener here. His voice sounded slow and sluggish. Drunk almost. Well, Noel, I don't need any landscaping done. I'll take care of that myself, thank you very much. I offered him the shears, which he accepted after a few seconds. Neck acne looked like you wanted to punch me, a feeling that was very much reciprocated. My daughter wandered out of the house and joined us at the edge of the garden. And then Noel said, I'm Noel. I'm the gardener here.
again. Slightly confused, I cleared my throat. Um, uh, I'm Thomas, and this is my daughter, Angela. Pleased to meet you, she said, offering him her hand, and then when he didn't respond, she reeled it away and quickly cleared her throat. Uh, so, Noel, how do you like it here at Redburn? The muscles in his mouth spasmed involuntarily as his blue eyes glazed over. The assisted living facilities enable us to enjoy independence with a safety net of highly trained nurses available 24 hours a day. The staff ensure even the smallest details receive their full attention, offering me and my loved ones complete peace of mind. It's a glorious place to wake up each morning. Cozy, friendly, warm. Okay, I replied after a short pause. Here, we don't just live. We don't just live. We don't. Noah's eyelids fluttered as if he had gotten laid out by a straight right cross. I, I... He looked from Angela to me and then back and forth. I, I don't want this anymore. He gasped, his whole body trembling. Neck acne quickly clamped a firm hand around Noel's shoulder, leaning in close. Let's go, Mr. McCann. The Avi on the west side of the main building's gone crap again. Uh, Ivy? That's right. You're Noel, the gardener here. Remember? Yes. Yes, I I'm Noel. I'm the gardener here. His voice sounded brisk and relaxed once again. We watched the two men totter off along the curved road. The orderly's hand flat against Noel's back. And then I turned to Angela and said... What's his problem? Honestly, Dad, don't be so insensitive. The poor guy's obviously got something wrong with his head. Her tone reminded me of the one my wife took any time I pointed out how ugly kids had gotten these days. Oh, looks like he's not the only one, I said, gesturing broadly over the street. Had a dozen other residents dragging themselves up and down the path on metal walkers. Past others who stood on their front walkways like mannequins. Angela grabbed a hefty box from the back of the van. Oh, what is this even? Your mother's antique cutlery. I'll give it here. It switched from her hands to mine. At 68 years of age, I was no spring chicken. Before decades of work in construction had left me reasonably well-muscled. What's it made of? Gold? Uh, silver, actually. Rummaging through a smaller, more manageable box, she said... Do you really need all this crap? What are you planning to do with it? That's not crap. That's my backup torch into Decker Power Drill. Do you know how much that beauty cost? I know what it is. I'm asking what you need it for. We'll say there's a power outage and I have to put up a poster board. Angela threw up her hands. Get the staff to help. The doctor specifically told you. Uh, don't get me started with that quack. See, that's the problem with your generation. You listen to all these fancy buzzwords and think you've got a million imaginary diseases. Honestly, Dad, sometimes it's like you're obliged to have an opinion on everything under the sun. And with that, she stormed off into the house. The two of us decorated each room with quaint, sentimental objects that reminded me of Mary. At one point, Angela happened across a picture of me and her mother on our wedding day and went all quiet, her bottom lip quivering. Paternal instinct told me that she needed a hug. I threw my arms around her, kissed the top of her head, and then gently cradled her like a baby. No matter how old kids get, they never stop needing their dad. Mary often joked about our daughter being my Achilles heel, about how she had a direct line through my stubborn nature. You've got a prickly outer shell, Thomas Donnelly, but that's all just a front. She would say with a cheeky grin, Secretly, you're a big teddy bear. And we stood there in silence, my arms wrapped around Angela, until at long last she said, I miss her so much. I know, sweetheart, I know. Before we had finished unpacking, another member of the Redburn staff knocked on the front door. Unlike the previous fella who had a skinny neck ravaged by acne, this one had no neck at all. 
He looked like a potato with a face carved into the front. Past him above the rooftops, the sun had almost set. Had the whole day already blitzed past. When I pulled open the door, the potato-faced man said, Excuse me, but Miss Flanagan has requested your daughter stop by the main office to discuss emergency contact information. The frequent pauses he took to draw breath made his speech pattern weirdly stilted. Uh, but there's still so much to do. Angela protested. I'll go, I said. I'll handle the rest. After unloading those final boxes, I sized up every room. And then, like an expert surgeon, I laid out an assortment of tools all real men should have. Screwdrivers, tape measures, hammers. The idea of lounging about all day made my stomach churn. That's why I had protested when Mary initially suggested that we retire. Of course, once she got the diagnosis, I started hating myself for not listening. My work sabbatical was meant to be temporary, but after the funeral, the boss called me into his office and said, Wouldn't it be nice if you had more time to yourself, Tom? My younger me would have raised a fit at some guy pushing him out the door like that, but after losing Mary, it hardly seemed worth the fight. I became numb to the world, stuck in, run out of the clock, made with nothing to do besides home DIY, and there'd be no shortage of that now since I had taken up residence in an absolute bombsite of shoddy worksmanship. The glass door opening to the rear garden jammed at the midpoint. Half the cabinet hinges were losing their baby's teeth, and the floorboard squealed louder than my grandson any time you told him that he couldn't play his Nintendo. But first, that front lounge demanded a shelf on the sidewall, a place to display Mary's favorite necklace, along with some select photographs. After mounting the mini shrine, I gently ran my fingers across a shot of her taken down by the beach. What do you think, sweetheart? I said. Would you still love me now that I'm a useless old fogey? Her picture didn't answer. It had never answered. From the corner of my eye, I spotted a strip of wallpaper peeling away from the uh, skirting board, directly beneath the window. Grunting heavily, I got down onto my knees for a closer inspection, my spine feeling like it had gotten hammered by hot iron. Alongside my head, that scraggly feline from earlier jumped up onto the outside ledge. Half of the cat's left ear was missing, and judging by the missing clumps of fur, it had gotten into a brawl with an electric razor. You could barely tell that it was a tabby. Go on, get. While I furiously wrapped the glass, the cat lifted a hind leg and casually licked its own crotch. Murmuring my disdain, I rolled up my sleeves and peeled away the wallpaper, only to discover the beginnings of deep marks etched into the wall, some so deep that my thumb fit right inside them. I let out a low whistle. To me, it looked like somebody had gone back and forth with an axe and then done a third-rate job at papering over the damage. No two ways about it. The entire lounge needed to be replastered. As I mused over the best-sized trowel for the job, practically giddy with excitement, the doorbell rang. A nurse with long, dark hair stood on the front porch. Mr. Connolly, I presume. Uh, call me Thomas. Pleasure to meet you, Thomas. I'm Prisha, one of these staff nurses here. I've come to give you a checkup. Ah, uh, checkups. Otherwise known as the perfect opportunity for smart Alex to point out the things you already knew didn't work right. Still, always better to get things over and done with. Fine. In the lounge, she fitted a tube around my arm and inflated the cup before listening to my heartbeat through a stethoscope. Already bored of the dreary silence, I asked. Well, how long have you worked here? I just started two days ago, she answered. Her attention focused on my wrist as she tracked the pulse. You're in pretty good shape, Thomas. You'll have to tell me your secret. Oh, you know the usual. Drink plenty of water, get as much fresh air as you can. And I was a builder for 40 years. And that'll keep you fit, all right. She grabbed a notebook from her pack and flicked through my case notes. Now, what's this about a metal plate? I drummed my forehead. No work mishap, not my fault. Some idiot who had no business being on the construction site. He got the sack and I got a plate on my skull. Oh, sounds nasty. 
She handed over a clear plastic tray with a little compartment on it for the red and yellow pills. Okay, so we're going to keep you on a basic course of meds. Nothing serious, just some essential vitamins. But generally, you're in tip-top shape. I wish the rest of our residents were as healthy as you. <laughs> Reckon you could put that in a letter and post it to my daughter. She smirked. With that, the nurse gathered up her things and said her goodbyes and then left. In the kitchen, I heated a tuna casserole and ate it standing next to the counter. The cat followed me around the back of the house, watching my plate fixedly from the window beyond the sink, its single eye glowing against the dusk. I suppose you're looking to get fed, huh? I said. The cat licked the roof of its mouth as though agreeing with the statement. Well, forget it. A spontaneous staring contest broke out. I will blast you with the hose. My agitation gradually boiled over into anger as the four-legged menace refused to budge. That's it. Don't say I didn't warn you. I framed a photo of Mary stood on top of the microwave, a sentinel on guard duty. Her picture almost seemed to frown at me. Oh, come on. I wasn't serious. Throughout the years that we had spent together, my wife almost drove me to the loony bin by constantly bringing home injured critters. Back then, it nearly drove me up the wall, but now, I'd give anything, literally anything, to have her barge through the door carrying a baby bird with a busted wing, just one last time. All right, I muttered to her picture. I scrapped leftovers onto a plate and set them on the outside step. The sentient ball of fuzz wasted no time getting stuck right in. Narrowing my eyes, I said, This is a one-time deal. Don't get any funny ideas. After washing up, I wasn't yet ready for bed and honestly, felt rather lonely sitting there, mindlessly flicking through photo albums. When you lose your soulmate, they leave behind this unpluggable gap. One no amount of petroleum-based putty could ever fill. Although Mary never strayed too far from my thoughts, a late night stroll would at least help clear my mind. Outside, warm light spilled from the lampposts, contrasted by the darkness of the road. A high iron fence surrounded the entire estate, the only way in or out through an automatic gate, because the last thing that people my age want is break-ins or drug addicts lounging around. A curved pavement carried me past handsome homes, each time the wind gusted, leaves scattered across gardens and back doors banged lightly. Another sure sign these people didn't understand the meaning of home repairs. The main building dozed, despite it not being all that late. Most likely the feebler residents had already turned in for the night. I continued along that asphalt road until up ahead, a distorted shape blitzed across my path, quickly disappearing between two houses. It only stayed visible for a fraction of a second, probably my imagination. At my age, my eyes play tricks. Further along, I got a glimpse of a silhouette peeking over a slanted roof. A sudden gust of wind made me squint, and by the time my eyes adjusted, the thing had vanished. The dang optician had warned me about not wearing my reading glasses more often. Just then, something swooped above my head, momentarily blotting out stars. A moment later, there was this brief, far-off growl. An odd mixture of a lion's roar and a jackal's bark. I couldn't dismiss that as blurred vision. My creaky knees rattled as I broke into a spontaneous jog, eager to get home. The growl, if you could even call it a growl, came again, and closer this time. I pinched my keys between my first and second fingers and I held up a closed fist. Thoughts of Mary got swallowed by fear. Mindful of the cramping muscles in my legs, I bolted from one circle of light to the next until, midway between two points, my left foot clonked against a solid object and it sent me tumbling forward. On instinct, my hands shot out. In your late 60s, a fall like that usually meant a one-way ticket to the ER, but Lady Luck had smiled down on me that night. My palms burned from where they had scraped against the asphalt, but I had survived. In a heartbeat, I scrambled back to my feet and spun toward whatever had tripped me, and as I did, my stomach clenched, because now I could see what it was. 
a pale figure flat on their back, completely motionless. A nasty jolt of terror stabbed me as I leaned close to the body and realized I would actually recognize the person lying there. It was Noel. His face looked pure white. The thin lips had gone bluish at the corners, and the entire right half of his neck almost appeared black from an ugly purple bruise. After failing to locate a pulse, I rushed home and called the Redbird in reception, and then watched through the lounge window as two orderlies loaded Noel onto a stretcher and wheeled it away. My hands refused to stop shaking. What sort of asylum had I checked into? A few minutes later, Potato Face stopped by, spouting off some stuff about Noel's heart giving out. What about the bruise? I demanded, shocked that he actually expected me to believe everything was hunky-dory. There was no bruise. No bruise? The poor guy had one the size of my fist. Mr. Donnelly, you're mistaken. It's late and you're tired. The two of us argued back and forth, me growing steadily more agitated, him sticking with his BS story until finally he signed off with. Miss Flanagan will explain everything tomorrow night at the weekly meeting. Okay, fantastic, explain away. Whatever she said made no difference to me because I didn't plan to stick around. Before, I had dismissed the lounge marks as the result of hiring a cheap laborer. But after hearing that growl and stumbling over Noel's body, suddenly they seemed more sinister. All night, I lay awake staring at the ceiling. I couldn't have slept a wink even with Mary beside me. First thing in the morning, I called Angela. Dad, what's going on? There is no need to worry about her plunging into the grisly details. Oh, everything's grand. I've just been thinking. This whole move might not be such a great idea. Why, what happened? Nothing, it's just I've had some time to think and you're right. Living with you might be the best option for everyone. Redburn's not really a great fit. Immediately, her voice lost any sense of empathy, of warmth. But Dad, the staff there work hard to ensure all residents enjoy their retirement in a relaxed, peaceful environment. Their assisted living facilities mean you'll enjoy maximum independence, but with a safety net of highly trained nurses, available 24 hours a day. She rattled off the spiel like a recording machine. Angela, why the heck are you talking like that? They'll ensure even the smallest details receive their full attention, offering you and your loved ones complete peace of mind. It's a glorious place to wake up each morning. Cozy, friendly, warm. At Redburn, you won't just live. You'll live to the fullest. She took a deep, shuddering breath. Yeah, I completely agree. You should stay put. Before I could get another word in, she signed off with, Hey, glad you're enjoying yourself. Gotta go. Love you. As I slumped back into an armchair, completely dumbfounded, the cat jumped up onto the window ledge and licked its front paw pad. Things were getting seriously weird. So, on my first night in Redburn Village, I had been stalked by a strange, shadowy figure and discovered my neighbors act all like absent-minded like a pack of zombies, and stumbled across the corpse of a fellow resident. For my own safety, I needed to get out, fast. Angela still had the moving van, but speaking with her over the phone, you would have thought they hired her to run their summer marketing campaign. Again and again, she regurgitated the brochure spiel about highly skilled nurses and complete peace of mind. While their meltdown could wait, I planned to catch a bus into Dublin, book myself an overnight stay at one of these cities and many overpriced hotels and send for my wife's things later. I loaded some spare clothes and an emergency toolkit into a suitcase and rolled it over to the front gate, where a bulky orderly came out of the hut and said, Where do you think you're going? None of your business. Open the gate. Well, seeing you're a resident here, I would say it is my business. Already seeing red, I clenched my jaw. I'm gonna count backwards from five. If that gate's not open by the time I reach one, we're gonna have a serious problem. 
Ah, get out of here. I don't want to see you here again. Got it. His giant arms folded across a burly chest. All those still fairly hefty from all those decades in construction. My fighting days were long done. I would have loved to wipe the smug grin off that guy's face. But just marching across the village really got me feeling the age in my joints. The guard would have had me seeing stars in no time. What's the big deal? I asked now furious. Residents aren't allowed to leave without permission. Whose permission? Miss Flanagan's. Ah, Miss Flanagan. The Redburn head honcho. Well, then get on your walkie-talkie and tell her to get out here, chop-chop. He smirked, refusing to say another word or budge a single inch, even as we squared off with one another. A showdown. I stormed into the main facility where thick black grime engulfed the point where two walls met the ceiling. How could they have let such a nice building fall into such poor condition? A short-haired receptionist behind the counter told me the same thing as the guard. Residents can't leave without permission. Well then go fetch Miss Flanagan now, I said. I can't. Why not? Well, because she's not here. If you need to speak with her, you can do that so at the weekly meeting at this evening. It's in the rec room at dusk. Hang about for a whole day after what happened. Was she joking? I already fed up with this nonsense. I grabbed my phone and dialed a 999. 20 minutes later, a squad car pulled up outside the front gate. And then two officers, a male and a female, climbed out. Yeah, I'm the one who called. I sat through the bars. I want to leave, but these people are holding me hostage. Behind me, the orderly muttered something into his radio before addressing the officers. This is Mr. Donnelly, one of our residents. Getting really close to the gate, he whispered. He's got dementia. You lying son of a... I snapped. Gently, he touched my arm. Mr. Donnelly, you live here, remember? House 17. Do you need help finding your way back? The officers exchanged a look as I swiped his hand away. I don't have dementia. My name is Thomas Donnelly. I'm a 68-year-old. I'm perfectly capable of looking after myself. And I want to leave. Mr. Donnelly, think carefully now. The orderly spoke in the same soft tones I used whenever my daughter got scared by thunder back in the day. You live here now. It's 2022, you remember? I know what year it is. I pushed my chest right up against the gate and grabbed the male officer's collar through the bars. These people are all crazy. There are claw marks in my lounge and last night I found a body. Over my shoulder, the orderly said. One of our beloved residents passed away last night. Mr. Donnelly's taking it pretty hard. Now, matching the guards a condescending tone, the male officer said. Don't worry, we'll get things straightened out. That didn't exactly inspire me with confidence. All four of us went back and forth, me growing steadily more agitated, until Precia, the nurse from before, wandered over, accompanied by two orderlies, neck acne and potato face. So far, she was the only person at Redburn who acted like a regular human being. I said, Precia, tell these people that I'm not senile. She gave a vacant stare. And then with zero compassion in her voice, she said, Come on, Mr. Donnelly, let's get you home. All this agitation won't be good for your heart. My stomach churned. Why had she called me Mr. Donnelly rather than Thomas? Her accomplices stepped forward, arms raised. I faced the officers again and said, They've got to her as well. Four hands seized me from behind, hooking into my armpits and around my waist. Don't let these lunatics take me, I screamed, my anger giving way to panic. As the orderlies hauled me away, the female officer calmly called after us. Mr. Donnelly, why don't you have a rest and see if you're feeling better tomorrow? If you're still upset, give us another call then we'll check everything's okay. My previous dismissal of Noel as a basket case echoed bitterly in my mind. As the guards frog-marched me down the street, past other Redburn residents standing idle in their gardens, or wandering aimlessly up and down the road, Neck Acne said, You're quite the troublemaker, Mr. Donnelly. 
When Miss Flanagan hears about the fuss you've caused, she's not going to be happy. He snatched the mobile phone from my fanny pack before I could react. Unable to wrestle free, I said, Who the heck are you people? We're the staff, answered the fat one. And we're here to help. Back at my house, the guards had dragged me through the hall and into the lounge, where they forced me out of the chair. Prisha offered me some pills from her nurse's case, which I knocked out of her hand and onto the floor. Those guys weren't pumping me with any drugs. Neck acne dismissed her and potato face before turning toward the exit. Why are you doing this? I asked. This is elder abuse. And grinning slyly, he peeked back over his shoulder. Yeah, yeah, take it up with Miss Flanagan. On his way toward the door, his eye happened across a picture of Mary. The shelf, was it here before? No, I put it up. I know the idea of home maintenance is a frightening concept to your generation, but in my day, men knew how to fix things, and they respected their elders too. He studied the shelf for a moment. His bottom lip pushed out as if mildly impressed. Don't cause any more trouble, he said and then slammed the door. Supported by the armchair, I stood with a heavy grunt and went over to the bookcase in the corner. On the third shelf, the box containing my wife's antique cutlery sat open. For decades, that collection seemed so silly and pointless to me. But since the funeral, all of Mary's personal belongings, no matter how mundane, kept her fresh in my memory. I picked up a photo of us down by the beach. Letting my fingertips brush across her smiling face, I said, How about all this, huh? Letting Laurel and freaking Hardy push me around. My thoughts drifted back to the day that photo got taken. Mary's 23rd birthday, one year before Angela came along. On the way back from buying a couple of ice creams, I saw some weirdo smack my wife's backside. Within seconds, I had that guy flat on his back, his jaw permanently realigned six inches to the left. What the heck happened to me? My younger self would have scoffed at those two muppets. It was long past time somebody set these guys straight. At dusk, I pulled on a jacket and stormed over to the main building. Being outdoors so close to dark made me feel exposed and vulnerable, but I couldn't exactly barricade myself indoors. No way to reach the outside world. Who knew what those evil guys might have done? Halfway toward the main facility, that mangy cat blitzed across my path. I lifted one foot and then the other in a waltz, awkwardly trying not to crush the little fur ball. The feline stopped long enough to hiss at me. Oh, don't tell me you're going to start acting up as well, I said. It hissed again before disappearing beneath a nearby rose bush. Inside the main building, I trooped up to the front desk and slammed both fists against the counter. Where is Miss Flanagan? Follow me, said a voice from behind. It belonged to Potato Face. He led me through a series of hallways, all large and luxurious, decorated in pastel shades of pleasant green. With every turn, I saw plaster flaking off the walls, or mold creeping up above a skirting boards. There was a horrible stink of damp and mildew everywhere. Potato Face led me into a high ceilinged room filled with several rows of foldable chairs split by a wide central aisle. A sea of old people had already gathered together. Orderlies and nurses stood in single file behind a podium, on the far side of the gloomy crowd. Well, I said to my chubby guide, where is she? She'll be along any minute. Have a seat. I shuffled across the very back row past a frail figures stooped over in their chairs. I sat between a lady with bloodshot eyes rather than a Massey Ferguson and a curly-haired fellow who had an oxygen tank plugged into his nostrils. None of the residents responded to any of my questions. They just sat idle like mindless zombies. After a few minutes of uncomfortable silence, the fluorescent lights above our heads dimmed as the far swung door opened, and then Miss Flanagan finally emerged. She had long, dark hair with a white streak through the middle, pulled into a bun so tight that it stretched the skin along her forehead taut. She stood at roughly my height, 
or thereabouts, and her sharp features reminded me of Angela's old porcelain dolls. Neck acne trailed behind her, eyes fixed on me. Taking her place behind the podium, Miss Flanagan said, Good evening, everyone. A voice, as soft and soothing as a pillow, came out that hard, narrow mouth. The mob responded in perfect unison. Good evening, Miss Flanagan. As she took a moment to adjust her notes, I pushed myself up, ready to demand answers. But then the lights went all the way out. Now I could see where Miss Flanagan's eyes, her shiny silver eyes, from beyond the veil of blackness, she said. Repeat after me. The Redburn Retirement Village offers residents a wonderfully elegant and relaxed lifestyle in a beautiful environment. Those words hit like a thunderbolt. They seemed to bounce off the walls, echoing all around, rattling my bones. Retirement Village offers residents a wonderfully elegant and relaxed lifestyle in... The crowd repeated. Once they finished, she had said... The assisted living facility allows you to enjoy maximum independence but with a safety net of highly skilled nurses for emergencies like cleaning, meals, and activities. Assisted living allows us to enjoy, and they continued. Had I joined a freaking cult? Is that why they wouldn't let me leave? Were they gearing up for some Heaven's Gate crap? When she had rattled off the spiel, her lanky crony came down the aisle barely visible in the gloom. Every time that Miss Flanagan spoke, her words seemed to creep along my throat. Here, the staff ensures that even the smallest details receive our full attention. This made no sense. What made me want to copy her? Had these nutters slipped some kind of mind suppressant into my meds? Now desperate, I shoved past our other residents rolling wheelchairs aside and knocking over metal walkers. At Redburn, you won't just live. We won't just live. If anybody asks how you're doing, you'll tell them that you're as happy as can be. We're as happy as. You will act in service of Redburn. In service of Redburn. By the time that I got to the center aisle, neck acne was already there and waiting. He grabbed a hold of my shoulder. Going somewhere, Mr. Donnelly. Although I sorely wanted to deck the guy, my aged body couldn't take slugging it out with a younger man. Better to swallow my pride and live to fight another day. I just nip into the bathroom, old bladder. I forced a friendly chuckle. I really think you should listen to the presentation. Quickly, he grabbed my other shoulder, so I spun toward the podium. My spine cracked from the pressure of him twisting my arms behind my back, forcing me in the direction of those dazzling eyes. My limbs got pressed almost to the point of dislocating. With every step forward, Miss Flanagan's words became fiercer, more intense. You are here to serve. We are here to serve, chanted the living dead. It took all of my self-control not to join them. Pushing his lips right up against my ear, the orderly said, Look into her eyes. You will obey the staff here at Redburn. My head whipped wildly from one side to the other. No, screw off. You're bent on causing trouble, aren't you? He said, frustrated. With that, he forced me past the podium, through the door that Miss Flanagan had arrived by, in a room with a filing cabinet a wooden table with green chairs on either side, and another door on the far wall. Neck Agni stood guard, refusing to answer any of my questions and ignoring my empty threats. From through the closed door, I heard the residents mindlessly chant along for several minutes, before slowly shuffling back into the hallway. The instant Miss Flanagan stepped into the room, I said, Okay, what the heck's going on? Quiet, she said. There was a sudden traffic jam in my throat. Calmly taking a seat behind the table, Miss Flanagan said to her enforcer, Well? He fetched a case file from the cabinet and handed it to her. This is Mr. Donnelly, the troublemaker that I warned you about. I think that he's immune. 
and the way that her lips pursed as she studied the notes set my skin shivering. Locking her eyes on mine, she sharply said, Sit. Obeying the order, my legs marched around the chair where they gave way. I couldn't climb back to my feet. I had become super glued to the cushion. Well, not completely immune, she said. After glancing through the notes, she said to her assistant, It must be the metal plate in his skull. If he's going to put up this much resistance, there's no sense keeping him around. If he calls the police again. With considerable effort, I pushed myself up off the chair and forced my lips apart. No, hang on a sec. Sit back down. Immediately, my legs turned to slop, soft and mushy, she said. Well, tell this family that he had a heart attack. He's fresh out of the hospital from a virus. When are you going to do it? He asked. Miss Flanagan's stomach grumbled. Tonight. It took all my willpower to say, What are you two clowns talking about? Heart attack. I'm healthier than an ox. Look, I, I don't know. Mr. Donnelly, you're burning up. She said, her voice dripping with impatience. The room immediately became a furnace. Look, you're turning green. The pit of my stomach churned and twisted, and your pulse won't stop climbing. My heart thudded painfully in my chest. As she leaned forward across the table, those bright eyes locked onto mine. I can't remember the last time I saw a man look so sick. The word sick bounced around inside my skull. Darkness pressed tight against me. However, despite the haze, I continued protesting. Grasping the air like a drowning man, I rocked from side to side. No, no. She conversed with neck acne for a little while, her words too garbled for me to understand. Until, out of nowhere, that thick haze began to lift. Little by little, my strength returned. I could think clearly again. Had whatever drugs they had pumped me worn off, it didn't matter, because it seemed like they had planned on killing me before I could shine a spotlight on whatever insanity they had planned. Miss Flanagan leaned even further forward. Her yellow carrion breath tasted of expired meat, thick and pungent. Stuck in the chair, my final thoughts were of Mary, of her laying in a hospital bed, sickly pale, while the doctors explained all they could do now was make her comfortable. Goodbye, Angela. I love you. Don't cry. I'm off to join your mother. As Miss Flanagan put her hand on the very edge of the table, it jerked awkwardly, momentarily throwing her off balance. After quickly recomposing herself, she pursed her lips, shot neck acne a sharp look and said, I thought I told you to fix that dang wobble. Sorry, ma'am. The assistant stammered, scared to meet her gaze. Oh, we'll get somebody to look at it. She shot up and circled the desk, clearly agitated. Eyes fixed on the floor, neck acne said. What a shame Mr. Donnelly has to die. He's a bit of a handyman. Die. The word echoed in my mind. It felt weird to hear it said so casually. Miss Flanagan's forehead became one large, threatening wrinkle. What? Visibly flustered, he bent down and fumbled through the notes. Uh, yeah, it says here that he worked construction for 30 years. When I went over earlier, he'd already put up a new shelf. She pushed her tongue into her cheek, completing this information. Change of plans. She quickly reached forward and grabbed both sides of my skull. You love it here at Redburn, Mr. Donnelly. You want to help us, don't you? Those giant eyes pierced my soul. Her words still had that compelling quality, only this time. The rest of the world didn't melt away. I could have spit in her face if I wanted to, but the squeaky wheel gets the oil. I needed to think smart. Maybe if I played along, they would let me go. At least for now. Making my face completely neutral, I said. Yes, I want to help. Good. Then tomorrow, Bernard here will give you a list of jobs and they need to be done. You will obey his instructions and fix everything that he tells you to. My arms hung loosely at my sides while I nodded along. If anybody comes to check on you, be it your family or the authorities, you will tell them that you've been feeling run down, 
You'll explain that you've been under the weather, but the staff here are doing everything to make you feel comfortable. After completing your assigned duties, you'll report back here at sundown. Do I make myself clear? Yes, Miss Flanagan. Good. And with that, she released me and got up and exited the room through the side door. Sinking into the chair, I quickly snatched air into my lungs. Immediately, my thoughts steered back to Angela, to Potato Face asking her to see Miss Flanagan before. her. Had they pumped her full of drugs too? Maybe that's why she ignored my calls. Before I could get any of this straight in my mind, Neck Agni dragged me out of the room, through the main facility, all the way back home, where he stuffed me through the front door and said, I'll see you tomorrow, bright and early. Yes, sir, I answered obediently. In the lounge, I collapsed onto the armchair. Those giant claw marks were still there. Where had they come from? And why were Miss Flanagan's eyes so dazzling? What had Miss Flanagan planned to do before her assistant had spilled the beans about my DIY skills? Drill a hole in my frontal lobe, maybe? Or offer me up as some ritual sacrifice? Well, in any case, I needed to get the heck out of Redburn. But how? I had no communication to the outside world. All the staff seemed somehow involved with this madness. And the place was a regular Fort Knox. As I sat there contemplating my limited options, the one-eyed cat jumped up onto the outside windowsill and brushed back and forth against the glass, meowing loudly. I glanced at Mary's picture up on the shelf, back to the noisy critter, and then reluctantly slid open the window. The fur ball strolled in like he owned the dang place. I poured a saucer of milk for him, followed by a glass of whiskey for me. A sadness unlike anything that I had ever felt before crashed over me like a wave. Until now, the notion of my own death had seemed like an event that couldn't come fast enough. Always too far off. Years, possibly even decades away. But now the big day had almost arrived. The meter was running, and that terrified me. I looked at Mary's photo for advice, and like always, she only smiled back. After licking its face clean, the purring cat jumped up onto my lap, curled into a ball and closed its single eye. Scratching its soft, warm belly, I let out a deep sigh. Fella, we're in some serious trouble. All night, I sat in that armchair, the mangy cat curled up on my lap. Every time that I closed my eyes, Miss Flanagan's silver ones flashed through my mind. Well, come sundown, I'd be seeing those horrible eyes again. First thing in the morning, Neck Acne pummeled the front door and gave me a list of things to do. I strapped on my tool belt, filled a duffel bag with drills and screwdrivers, and went from house to house, crossing off items like leaky taps and squeaky hinges, really dragging out every job, delaying my inevitable return to Miss Flanagan's house. The whole time, I acted like a stage hypnotist had placed me under a trance so that Neck Acne wouldn't get suspicious. In those marches between homes, the cat watched from across the streets or halfway up trees. Was it my imagination, or did the little critter actually look concerned? In one house, a short lady with a bottleneck glasses sat quietly listening to a radio turned to a golden oldie station. And wouldn't you know it, Rocket Man by Elton John came on right as I finished realigning her crooked picture frame. That song was playing the day that Mary and I first met. While taking a break from remodeling a kitchen, I had popped into a bakery for a quick scone. A lady behind the counter stood with her back to me. She reached over and turned up the volume on a nearby radio. Uh, don't you just love Elton? She asked as she turned around, really feeling the music. Even in a flimsy apron and cheap hairnet, she was the most gorgeous creature on planet Earth. Without the slightest idea who Elton was, I said, He's the best. After six weeks of visiting that bakery almost every day, long after I had finished the kitchen and stopping by for a quick scowl on a many 20 minute drive out of my way, I finally plucked up the courage to ask her for dinner. What took you so bloody long? was the response. By mid-afternoon, half the repairs were checked off. 
In a weird way, it felt nice to be useful again, despite the circumstances. In the main building, nurses spoon-fed residents cream pudding and mushy vegetables. As I flitted between rooms, tightening sink pipes, replacing bulbs, and refastening a ceiling fan that had come away from the plaster. With only a half hour until sundown, there was only one task left on my list. Miss Flanagan's wonky table. I followed neck acne into the little office where, before I could unpack my tools, Parisha came to confer with him privately. He said to me, Fix that table and then stay put. I'll be back before dusk. Got it? Yes, sir. Finally, he had given me some breathing space. This was my chance, but where could I go? Orderlies patrolled the entire village, not to mention that gate. There had to be a phone somewhere. If I got my hands on some evidence these people were all deranged cultists, the police might not dismiss me as a crackpot. Again. My eyes scanned the room. In the filing cabinets, there was nothing but medical charts and case notes. The desk was mostly stuffed with red burn flyers and admin paperwork. The heavy door in the corner wouldn't open, although that posed a little challenge to my combo multipurpose drill, and Angela said that I wouldn't need it. The loud screams of the divots made me cringe, terrified that an orderly might hear the rackets and spoil my plan. Luckily, the sound went unnoticed. I lifted the handle away, took a deep breath, pushed open the door and then stepped into a thick darkness. The only light coming from my torch. A cold draught seeped into my old bones as I searched the room. It was completely bare except for a large wooden box propped up against the far wall. An expert craftsman must have carved the whole thing. My fingers glided smoothly across the top. Only when I leaned forward and studied the object up close did it become clear what I had actually touched. A casket. My knees began to rattle. Why the heck would the Redburn staff keep that next to Miss Flanagan's office, had they picked it out for me? As I reeled my hand away, my fingers must have nudged a latch, because all of a sudden, the lid shivered open several inches. Four sharp fingers reached out of the narrow gap. Who's there? Called a groggy voice from within, like someone who had been shaken awake. As the lid swung open with a horrible creak, I had to bite my bottom lip otherwise. I might have shrieked like Angela did when she was six and thought that there were monsters hiding in her closet. Miss Flanagan pulled herself out of the casket, except she looked different. She had a shrunken face, stretched taut over a well-defined skull, and nails like a fan of knives capping her bony hands. Who's there? She said, her voice carrying deep into the room. And as she spoke, I glimpsed a mouth stuffed with curved fangs whiter than porcelain. Before there was even time to gather my thoughts, her eyes, those dazzling silver eyes, opened wide. You, she snarled. Spinning away, I made a desperate break for the door. Miss Flanagan flew forward, collided with my back, and sent us both careening forward into the adjacent room, where her body flinched and spasmed. We had landed a square in the middle of a square of light, thrown across the floor by the window on our left-hand side. Smoke billowed from Miss Flanagan's hands as she shielded the charred half of her face before recoiling into the shadow of the other room. Still gasping for air, I crawled over to the table and hoisted myself up. Flesh bubbled and burst across Miss Flanagan's wrists and palms, but not for long. Within seconds, as if by magic, her wounds healed themselves up. Mr. Donnelly, she said sharply, come here. My muscles locked up briefly, now looking like her former human self. She beckoned me toward her with a single bony finger. Instead, I scrambled toward the door, snatching my tool bag along the way. She repeated the commands more forcefully each time but whatever spell she had cast before had already been broken. Those sharp edges in her voice didn't touch me. I'm going to tear open your throat and drink your insides, she screamed. 
That sentence chased me into the auditorium, where I slammed the door shut and paused to catch a breather. Okay, Miss Flanagan was a vampire. That meant vampires existed, and I was trapped inside an unescapable fortress with one. Things started making more sense. The residents weren't in a cult, they were puppets. The plate in my skull gave me some degree of immunity to her hypnotism, so she had decided to bump me off. But how did any of this help? Even if there was a way to contact the outside world, nobody would ever believe me. Neck acne came through the door on the opposite side of the room. What's all the racket? He shouted. And then, you were supposed to wait for me. Get back in there. What that thing? Not a chance. Neck acne had a good six inches on me. And me a good 40 years on him, but still, I couldn't let him offer me up like an appetizer. Hands quivering, I fumbled through my tool belt as he came forward. When there were only a few meters between me and the lanky guy, I held up a canister of WD-40 and I sprayed it into his sunken eyes. Immediately, he gave a shrill squeal then dropped to his knees, hands pressed tight against his leaky eyes. I hurried out into the corridor before he had a chance to recover. I'm casually strolling past orderlies and nurses so as to not make them suspicious, I made my way through the maze of halls. Two bends later, I happened across Potato Face who said, Weren't you supposed to wait in Miss Flanagan's office? May I change of plans? I replied, my voice all nervous. The boiler in the basement needs repaired. Hmm, let me check that with... From my belt, I grabbed a rubber mallet and swung it in a fierce, a downward arc. As it collided with nothing but growing, a sound escaped the man's mouth like a chipmunk huffing helium. He keeled forward with a faint whimper. Just a few steps from the front entrance, a two-note alarm began to blare. Receptionist went into a frenzied panic while I continued outside at a brisk pace. Above my head, the sky fumed with orange and red clouds. Vampires could come out after sundown, but there was nothing stopping the Redburn staff from coming after me. Given my advancing age, I needed a head start. I grabbed a hammer from my bag and tapped a nail into the frame, pinning the door shut. Now they would have to go all the way around back. What next? They patrolled the front gate and I would break my neck climbing the fence. So seeing no other choice, I hurried home. Halfway down the street, the cat blitzed out from behind a willow tree and followed me along, meowing nonstop as he followed me into my house. The sun had already half-dipped beneath the horizon, but never mind, Miss Dracula. Those dang orderlies had a spare key in case of emergencies. With the speed and vigor of a man half my age, I disassembled the kitchen furniture, harvested wooden boards, and haphazardly nailed them across all the doors and ground floor windows. Before sealing the final one in the lounge, I glanced down at my furry companion. Trouble's on the way, little fella. Last chance to make a break for it. He gave me a blank stare. Uh, suit yourself. Taking advantage of those last few minutes of daylight, I wrote Angela a note. Would she ever read it? Uh, probably not, but still. There were some things that needed to be said. Darling, always know that I love you. I'm so proud of you and the kids. You've got all the best qualities of me and your mother. Don't be sad, because now I'm with her again. Love, Dad. Outside, the sun finally slipped beneath the horizon. Either Miss Flanagan or her band of merry men would arrive any second now. Altogether, every light fixture in the house went out. I peeked through the narrow gap between two boards and saw orderlies and nurses positioned along the street, arms by their sides. Neck acne and potato face stood just beyond the hedge. Why didn't they try breaking in yet? Five seconds later, a silhouette passed above their heads, draping the group in a huge shadow. A moment later, glass shattered somewhere upstairs. By my feet, the cat's hair stood on end as though receiving an electrical shock. I think that he regretted not making a hasty escape when he had the chance. I scooped him into my arms. Upstairs, floorboards creaked and groaned as something traveled through the bedroom into the hallway. The ceiling seemed to breathe, creaking like my old joints. 
Outside, the Redburn staff closed in on the house, chanting in perfect unison. Here at Redburn Village, we work hard to ensure all residents enjoy their retirement in a relaxed, peaceful environment. Teeth chattering, I slowly shuffled into the hall and stood at the foot of the stairs. In my arms, the cat trembled fiercely, forcing me to continually readjust my grab. Our assisted living facilities enable you to enjoy maximum independence but with a safety net of highly skilled nurses available 24 hours a day, offering you and your loved ones complete peace of mind. A long twisted shadow engulfed the upstairs landing. Were those wings? My feet became blocks of cement as the shadow morphed, gradually becoming more human. And then Miss Flanagan appeared and said, Tisk tisk tisk, Mr. Donnelly. Whatever are we going to do with you? Her eyes flicked toward my hands. And look, you've got vermin with you. I could have sworn that I disposed of that flea bag months ago. That sent the fur ball into overdrive. After wrestling free of my grip, he bolted down the hall and into the kitchen. Really taking her time with every stop. Miss Flanagan let her fingers scrape across the wall, etching in deep marks. What's going on? I shouted. What is this place? She chuckled. Well, this is Redburn, the greatest retirement home in Ireland. Ask any of our residents. At the raise of her hands, the chants grew louder. It's a glorious place to wake up each morning. Cozy, friendly, warm. It's a glorious place to wake up each morning. Cozy, friendly, and warm. So, you go around hypnotizing the elderly to do your bidding. Is that it? Are you raising some sort of demon clan? She threw her head back and cackled. Please, I simply need to feed. Feed? Halfway down the steps, as she paused. I've been alive for thousands of years, Mr. Donnelly. For centuries, I've traveled to Eastern Europe feeding on peasants. But you humans are a suspicious bunch, always running me out of your towns and villages sooner or later. Even in the big cities, there was only so long that I could last before the ground shrunk beneath my feet. So I had an idea. A retirement home. People die in those all the time. Rather than feed on humans who had aroused suspicion, I could simply pick off ones already had one foot in the grave. They aren't as tasty, but angry mobs don't pick up a torch or pitchforks when they die. That's sick. Oh, please, she snorted. And then her eyes happened across a picture of Mary mounted on the wall. Tell me, is this Mrs. Donnelly? I uncomfortably shifted from one foot to the other. Well, good news. The two of you are about to be reunited. She glided down the stairs and a movement so smooth I almost didn't notice it until it was already too late. At the very last second, I rushed into the lounge and slammed the door shut. Through the door, Miss Flanagan shouted, Little pig, little pig, please let me in. I had to do something but what? All they had were my tools and Mary's antique cutlery. Wait. The door crashed open with enough force to dent the wall, and then Miss Flanagan entered the dim room. Her fangs bared. And quickly, I grabbed the torch from my pack, flicked on the beam, and took aim. My attacker left to the ceiling with a frightening grace. I tried to pin her down, following the sounds of claws chipping away at the ceiling, but she was too fast. The best that I could manage were brief glimpses of silver eyes. And judging from all the laughter, she quite enjoyed our little game of cat and mouse. With her hands hooked into claws, Miss Flanagan lunged at me from the corner of the room. Her nails pinwheeled across my face, opening red stripes across my forehead and cheek, just as I got the beam angled correctly. There was a sound like bacon sizzling on the grill as we both spun onto the floor. The torch whirled around toward the far side of the room outside of reach. Miss Flanagan grimaced. Black smoke billowed from her forehead while I fumbled through my belt found a pair of pliers, pushed myself to my knees and then pinched them close around her right fang. With every less drop of old man strength in my body, I pulled, squeezed, and twisted. Blinded by rage, Miss Flanagan thumped me in the chest with more force than a sledgehammer. 
I experienced a moment of complete weightlessness, brought crash into an end by the back of my skull hitting the shelf, the same one that decorated with Mary's things. Black dots swirled in front of my eyes as I spilled to the floor. A single fang was still pinched between my pliers. Already recovered from her burns, Miss Flanagan probed the gap in her mouth, using a long tongue that tapered off into a fine point. Her eyes narrowed. You made a big mistake, Mr. Donnelly. Just for that, I'm going to hunt down your entire family. You've got a daughter and some bratty grandchildren, right? Oh, it's been so long since I've had a decent meal. You have no idea. I'm going to rip their throats out and pull out their guts in steaming bundles. But first... Her jaw popped open like a trap door. Without warning, Miss Flanagan sprung forward and seized my neck, her warm tongue dragging along my cheek, a tentacle probing every inch of exposed flesh. A lone fang hovered inches above my throat. I felt powerless to stop it. This was the end. Forty years earlier, I still wouldn't have stood a chance. But then, a blurred, hissing object collided with the side of her head. The cat, the little critter, latched onto Miss Flanagan, frantically slashing her horrible face. She whirled around, attempting to pry the brave little critter off, but its claws were embedded way too deep. Dark blood seeped out of her forehead and throat as the cat carved out patterns of diagonal gashes. The pair waltzed around, banging into walls and tipping over the bookshelf, which made Mary's antique cutlery set crashed onto the ground and emptied its contents across the floor. All those tools, each made from pure silver, lay agonizingly close, but my muscles burned with age and fatigue. As the world it turned all blurry, possibly from a concussion, the orderly's chant sounded far in the distance. At Redburn, you won't just live. You won't just live. Above my head, the shelf gave way. Even expert workmanship couldn't withstand a collision with a fellow my size. A picture of Mary toppled onto my lap. The muscles in my arms had twanged wildly as I grabbed the photo and kissed her cheek. I'm so sorry, darling. I couldn't save them. I love you. My eyelids closed over, ready to embrace the end. But then, for the first time since she had passed, I heard Mary's voice, loud and angry. Are you freaking kidding me, Thomas? I opened my eyes. Did I accidentally marry some lazy bum who'd take this kind of crap? Didn't you hear her? That monster's gonna eat our grandbabies. Get off your butt, you lazy son of a gun. Before me, the furball held on as best it could, hissing and fighting and tearing deep into Miss Flanagan's lips. Well, if you could stand up to a vampire, so could I. Time to dust away the cobwebs from these old bones. With memories of Mary fresh in my mind, I reached forward and fumbled through her antique cutlery. Forks and spoons, nothing but freaking forks and spoons. Toward the bottom of the pile, though, I found a knife, finally. But would it be sharp enough to get the job done? Only one way to find out. Out in the hall, something hefty like Potato Face hurled itself against the front door while other Redburn staff rattled and drummed the windows. Bony talons reached between boards and swiped at the air. Now their mistress felt threatened. They wanted in. You won't just live. You won't just live. The drill lay close by. I grabbed some wire from my pack while Miss Flanagan successfully pried the cat off her face and hurled him against the side wall. That beautiful critter collided with a dull thump, fell onto the floor, and then flipped itself right side up. As I worked, Miss Flanagan dropped onto all fours, her snout elongating. Every inch of exposed flesh became black and furry. Fingers webbed themselves together and leathery skin connected her underarms with her back. That was the limit for my little ally, who blitzed out of the room, at which point the bad creature refocused its attention on me. Grunting heavily, I stood, armed and ready. In that moment, the clock rolled back thirty years. I was a young buck in his prime. A blast of hot air from two powerful nostrils blasted me in the face. With a single flap of her wings, Miss Flanagan flew across the room, seized me by the chest and rose up into the air, and then slammed us onto the brutal, unforgiving floor. 
The creature weighed more than a dang Ford Escort. The very second that we landed that horrible face, it began reverting to human form. Only this time, Miss Flanagan looked thinner, more delicate. As she glanced down at her torso, her eyes opened wider than dinner plates. Stabbed into her midsection was the end of my power drill, onto which I had tied the knife. She dropped us with such force the blade had punctured a hole in her side. Still flat on my back, I squeezed the trigger. The drill met some resistance and rotated slowly, gradually tearing apart Miss Flanagan before quickly picking up speed. As she rolled over, the tremendous pressure against my lungs eased. Outside, the chants trailed off midward and the rattle in it stopped. Blotting out the pain, I found my feet and grabbed the torch from the far side of the room. No, please, Miss Flanagan rasped, powerless to do anything beside rotate her silver eyes toward me. I pointed the torch directly at her face, took three deep breaths, and then said, Let this be a lesson to you. Never threaten a man's family. At the flick of the switch, she exploded into flames. The embers kicked up a large cloud of dry dust that went everywhere, and when the beast was finding nothing more than a powdery stain, I collapsed into the armchair. The entire world took a deep breath and sighed. I heard Miss Flanagan's mindless army groan outside, all deeply confused about how they had got there. The cat limped into the room, one paw curled up against his chest. I gently scooped him into my lap. A photo of Mary lay in the center of the room, and now she almost seemed to be smiling. In my mind's eye, I heard her sweet, sweet laugh, and suddenly, for the first time since her diagnosis, I found myself laughing too. As a group of residents and I strolled through the front gate, we waved at the burly attendant. How was the view from the summit? He had asked us. Worth the effort, one of my companions had called back. Since the encounter, the staff at Redburn and all of its inhabitants had been much more agreeable, livelier. So far as I could tell, Miss Flanagan's trance lifted the instant she had died. Everybody woke up from a sort of terrible dream once they couldn't remember much about it. After a few weeks, since nobody had the slightest idea where the former boss had disappeared to, a new manager took over, and things became a lot more fun around here. Down the street, as I parted ways with the group, one of my friends said, Hey, I'll see you for poker tonight then. Absolutely, I replied. It might be a little late though. Angela's bringing the grandkids over. They've got some new Nintendo that they want to show me. Back home, the one-eyed cat skulked around my garden, meowing impatiently, one paw heavily bandaged. It looked at me as if to say, Hey, it's almost noon, where's my lunch? All right, all right, I said chuckling. Shortly after becoming a vampire killer, I had rushed the cat to a vet who had wrapped up its busted leg and promised me that she would be okay. That sure caught me off guard. In the kitchen, I emptied a tin of cat food into a bowl. Etched along the outer edge was the name that I had christened my new companion, the most beautiful one that I could think of. Mary. And that, my friends, is how I rediscovered a new zest for life by checking into a retirement home. So, if you're around Dublin and looking for a place that'll let you enjoy an elegant lifestyle in a tranquil environment, with a safe unit of highly skilled nurses available 24 hours a day, have I got the place for you. And trust me, at Redburn, you won't just live. You'll live to the fullest.